Good morning. Thank you for the invite. Uh, this is the first time I come to this center in this building. It was interesting. Against this wall, there's a nice quote. It says teamwork. There are about four lines that explain that. And this is basically the trauma service. It's teamwork. Uh, nobody can do it on his own or her own. And trauma is made on different pillars. You are definitely the paramedics and the EMS and the first responders are the first and the very important pillar, one of the pillars to make a trauma service successful. Uh, we have other pillars. Uh, we have a radiology department that we cannot exist without. Uh, we rely on subspecialists, uh, mainly neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery, to a lesser extent vascular surgery, urology, and facial maxillary surgery. Uh, we are a level two trauma center at St. Alphonsus in Boise. Uh, currently, we are six surgeons, uh, all board certified in general surgery, and all have some form of a critical care expertise, although it varies. Some of them more in cardiac surgery, some of them in general uh, critical care. Uh, the most recent addition to our team was uh, Dr. Brittany Hill. Uh, she came to us from Emory in Atlanta after a two-year fellowship, and Dr. Mabry, John Mabry, who came from Oregon Health Science University. Uh, so, Pat approached me about a few weeks ago and she asked me uh, whether I would consider giving a lecture. And I said, sure, what's the topic? And her answer was, head injury, thoracic injury, abdominal injury, burns, and drowning. And you should have seen my face when she said that. And I said, this, how many lectures do you want? She said, only one, and you have one hour. So, we had a good laugh. Uh, so, I, I thought about it, and I will try to uh, tailor to, to your demand, and in order for me to cover all this subject in one hour, I have to jump and highlight the important points and the practical points, and I hope you will benefit from it. The other thing I want to say is that the best lectures that I have attended in my career was interact, interactive lectures, where there's, you can stop me, we can talk, discuss about things. And, and the best lectures are the ones that when I leave the lecture, I have learned something that I will not forget. Uh, there's a very nice saying that says, wise men learn from their mistakes, and maybe a wiser even men learn from other people's mistakes. And this is where we are. So uh, I'm George Monayergi. I have been with St. Alphonsus since 2001. And the first day on call for the trauma service was June 1, 2001. Uh, since then, there has been a lot of changes at St. Alphonsus Drama Services, but now, in 2014, we are a very, very strong department with all six surgeons that are fully committed to the trauma service. We rarely ever transfer a patient to a level one center unless there is a big, big problem or somebody is not available. Uh, and in a few weeks' time, we are going to get a pelvic surgeon. We lost Dr. Schweiger. He went to Alaska about five, six months ago. And we have a good facial maxillary service now, and we, are, we can take any case and, 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 and deal with it uh, and give a very good service. So I want to start with head injuries, and the, this is the first slide, skull. And the reason I put it like that, this is are the layers of, this, of the skull, basically. Skin, C for cutaneous tissue, of uh, aponeurosis, A, loose areolar tissue, and periosteum. And the reason I put this, is that from a practical standpoint, I have had cases come to our department from many other areas where the patient had a wound or a deglobing injury in the skull and the patient is bleeding. And nobody has taken care of that bleeding. They were so involved in other injuries, internal injuries, chest, abdomen, pelvis, fractures, that they have forgotten to deal with the skull. And the reason I put this is the skull is a very vascular organ very vascular organ. You can, uh, there are reports of people who have died from bleeding, from hemorrhagic shock, from skull injuries. I have definitely had a case where when we checked the hemoglobin, the hemoglobin was five. The patient had an injury eight hours earlier, was transferred to another center, from that center to our center, and still nobody paid attention. So if you see a skull injury, don't ignore it. If you have stitches, Put stitches, running stitch. You don't have to be to do any cosmetic surgery. If you have staples, put staples. If you don't have anything, put some curlics and coban and wrap it under pressure. Stop that bleeding. 
It's very important. Patients should not be in shock from bleeding from a scalp injury. We will take care of the rest. We will, we will reopen the wound, we will irrigate the wound, we will evacuate the hematoma, we will cover with antibiotics if necessary, although the scalp rarely gets infected because of the good vascular supply. If there's a degloving injury here, we can take care of it, either the trauma surgeon or a plastic surgeon, but make sure you don't find yourself in a position where the patient has lost one, two, three liters of blood from a scalp injury. This is something that can easily be dealt with. I don't want to expand on this. Everybody should know the Glasgow Coma Scale. What is the minimum number in the Glasgow Coma Scale? What is the highest? So well, there are four points for the eye opening, five points for the verbal response, and six points for the motor response. And the motor response is the most important one between all three of them. If the, if the letter T is attached, what does that mean? If I tell you 9T, what, is T, what does T stand for? One more time. T means intubated. 9T, when the patient is intubated, you assess them at 9 and you say T because the patient is intubated. If you don't put the T, it means the patient is not intubated. That's the only difference. So, the reason I have divided this into this category, GCS 3 to 8, 9 to 12, 3, 13 to 15, 3 to 8 is basically a patient who is coping to you. He's doing very well. Uh, most of the time, those patients will come. In most parts of the world, those patients will be going home after a CT scan. In the United States, and I was trained in the Middle East and then in England before I came to the United States. In the United States, we do a lot of defensive medicine because any mistake is costly. So a lot of the three to eight in our institution will be admitted for observation. Huh? Even 3 to 8 sometimes, sorry, 9 to 12 will be admitted to observation. 3 to 8 will be very likely going home with head injury instructions. Sorry, let's reverse. <laughs> 13, to 15, 13 to 15 are the ones that are doing very well. 13 to 15, and these are the ones that we might admit them under observation or discharge them. 9 to 12 are the ones definitely will be admitted under observation and sometimes to the intensive care unit and sometimes to the floor. It depends on the availability. Many times I'd like to admit a 9 to 12 patient to the ICU. There's no room. I have to put them in the neurosurgical floor, but I'm very, very tense about this situation. Make sure I speak to the nurse. Make sure there's somebody who's taking care and examining that patient in neuro, neuro assessment on, on hourly basis. The 3 to 8 is a completely different category. So 9 to 12 is, is, is a patient that will be admitted and most probably will have another CT scan. Four, six hours, ten hours later to make sure there has been no changes before we can send that patient home. If there's any change, we will act accordingly. This is just a slide to show you the relationship between volume and pressure in the brain. And the reason it's in this shape is that we can compensate till here, where the intracranial pressure remains reasonably below 20, and then you can see a sudden rise there when it the, the decompensates anymore. The reason I'm putting this, this slide is that I want you to... This is the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, and this is the most important thing for you to learn about head injuries. If I ask you what do you have inside your head, you're going to tell me brain, what else? CSF, what else? Blood in the form of arteries and veins. And because we have a skull that doesn't expand, the volume is stable. And this is the slide that shows you that the volume inside our skull should be stable. So, it's not a very clear slide, but here it shows you if there is any space occupying lesion. If there is any space occupying lesion like tumor, or, or hematoma is going to displace something. Something has to come out for that thing to take place in that volume. This is very important because this all we can do as non-neurosurgeons, you and I, for any traumatic brain injuries. 
and I will explain. The other thing I want to tell you about is cerebral perfusion pressure. That's very important. The cerebral perfusion pressure equals the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. So when I get somebody that you bring me with a head injury, my job is to try to get the mean arterial pressure, the systolic arterial, the mean arterial pressure is, is what? Systolic plus diastolic divided by two. Either the systolic or the mean, higher. Definitely I would like the mean to be above 65 and the systolic to be above 90. Because that would assess in my cerebral perfusion pressure. Now what can I do about the ICP, the intracranial pressure? Let's go back to that slide. Okay. Now if somebody has a, a bleeding lesion, a hematoma, whether it's epidural, subdural, whatever, there, that's taking some more, then I have to instruct my neurosurgeon that I have a patient who is critical. Here they have to do something called ventriculostomy or a bolt. Does anybody know the difference between the two? Both of them are devices that go in the ventricle and you aspirate some cerebrospinal fluid. The bolt will allow you just to measure the pressure. The ventriculostomy allows you to measure the pressure and drain some cerebrospinal fluid. So I'm very keen to drain cerebrospinal fluid to try to equalize what happened there. The blood is building up there, it's taking some of the volume. I want to decrease this volume so that I find myself still in this part of the curve where I'm still compensating. Once I decompensate, the prognosis goes down in a big way and very quickly. I don't want to reach intracranial pressure above 20, 30, 40. That's very dangerous. But what can I do? And I'm not a neurosurgeon. I cannot open the skull. This is the job of a neurosurgeon, to open craniectomy, evacuate the blood, etc. But in order to reach that state, there is a few hours where I can do something about it. And the thing I can do about it is try to drain the cerebrospinal fluid through a ventriculostomy and other things like The other thing that you and I can do is we can give mannitol, we can give Lasix, we can hyperventilate the patient, maintain the CO2 at about 32, all these things to help until we reach a stage where we can, to the trauma center where there's a neurosurgeon who can take over. These are the steps that need to be done. And recently, we have been doing, we're giving the patient a lot of anti-convulsant medication, especially Subdural hematomas, especially in the temporal areas, are prone to seizure activity. And the medication that we usually like is Keppra. <coughs> we give either 500 or 1,000 milligram as the loading goes, and then most neurosurgeons will keep it for about 500 twice a day for a week to prevent any seizure activity. So this is what I, we can do for bad head injuries. We can do Lasix, we can do Manitol, we can hyperventilate the patient uh, to try to minimize the intracranial pressure. We can keep them in a semi-sitting position that will minimize the intracranial pressure uh, until you reach the trauma center. Make sure the blood pressure is high to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure. And then the next step will be ventriculostomy to drain the cerebral spinal fluid plus or minus craniectomy. So this is the most important thing that I can teach you about head injury is that you understand the concept of this, the Monroe Kelly doctor. Once you understand it, you can deal with it and you can always try to stay on this side of the curve before you decompensate. Now, let me tell you about neurosurgeon, and I have worked, I've worked with many neurosurgeons for the past 30 years. You have to be a very special personality to become a, a neurosurgeon. They are very macho people. They like to project an image. We are gift to the world. <laughs> but things are changing. The concept is changing. The neurosurgeons now who have been at St. As for 25, 30 years are completely different personalities from, for example, Richard Lockhead, the new surgeon who came just a year ago. He's more pleasant. You can talk to him. He's down to earth. Things have changed. Those guys in the past did not have a CT scan. We did not have a CT scan. I remember very well being in the emergency department you bringing me a patient that is thrashing, that is moving, that's everything. What am I going to do? I'm going to try to give the patient something to sedate him, to control him, to maybe intubate him. 
And at the same time, I'm asking somebody to call the neurosurgeon and call. The neurosurgeon will come and start screaming at me. Why he is screaming at me? Because he wants to see the patient before any sedation is given, so that he can have a baseline of the neurological examination. Things have changed now because we have a CT scan. The CT scan is better than any neurosurgeon in telling what's going on in the brain. So things have changed. And they are, with time, realizing they are part of a big team, uh, trauma team. So the relationship with the neurosurgeon is much better than 15, 20 years ago. Now, these are some slides to show you some CT scans. This is midline shift. Midline shift means there is something in one side of the hemisphere of the brain pushing to the other side putting pressure on important structures, on basic centers, respiratory centers, cardiac centers, and the brain stem. This is something very serious. Up to about five millimeter midline shift, we can accept and sit on it and repeat the CT. Once it's more, then you have to get to the problem. What is causing the problem? And a lot of the times, it's like hematomas building up, like this epidural hematoma. Most epidural hematomas are arterial in nature. Most subdural hematomas are venous in nature. Subdural hematomas are very common in the elderly. Can somebody tell me what is the advantage of an old person has over a young person? More space. That's very important. It's amazing how much they can tolerate more bleeding than the young people. And give us some more time to evacuate. This is a lot of contusions, brain contusions. Uh, this, there are four different types of herniation. You don't need to all know all that, but once the intracranial pressure reaches a certain stage, usually the uncle herniation is the most common. And this is the part where the tonsils, the tonsils of the cerebellum go down through the foramen magnum and press on the mid-brain mid, 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 uh, structures, and this is synonymous with death. Now, just a note to let you know what happens to a bad head injury that you bring me to St. Al's. This is the part that you might not know about. I, I receive a patient with a GCS of 3 to 8 from you. It's my job to resuscitate the patient to my best ability. We intubate, we try to maintain pressure, maintain cerebral pressure. If necessary, put a ventricolostomy, drain the cerebrospinal fluid, give hypertonic saline, which is a relatively new concept to try to minimize the edema, give anticonvulsant therapy, but deep inside, I know this patient is not going to make it. But I still have to continue to resuscitate this patient. Can somebody tell me why the main reason that I'm doing that? I have spent nights and nights up resuscitating a patient that I know is going to die. Liability one? Huh? Organ, donation. It's, it's becoming very important that we consider that and, and we spend a lot of time before even we see the relatives. Or we don't know how the family is going to react to, to the question is, are we going to allow us to do donation? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. The Spanish culture, the Mexican culture, from our experience, does not favor very much donation. Very few will agree to donation. Something to do with their religion, uh, culture. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of people who will agree and consider it like a, a closing thing the loss of loved one when, when that patient. So that will put a lot of pressure on the trauma surgeons because we have to resuscitate until we get permission, until the transplant team come and until the transplant team come and decide whether this is a good candidate for donation or not, what organs are. And then there's something called cardiac death now when we cannot declare brain death. We go to the operating room and we allow the heart to settle and the blood pressure to go down after we extubate the patient. We have to be there and we have to sign papers while the transplant team is ready to go. They come usually from either California or Oregon or Seattle. And Idaho is, is for, for the past few years, has been a very good donating state. Can you tell me why? No law huh? no for seat belts, for uh, helmets. Uh, this is a big problem. And I cannot tell you how many young people would have survived if they had the helmet on. Okay, this is, I show this simply because it's very common with epidural hematoma. You have a, a blood building up in the temporal area that presses on the oculomotor nerve, the third cranial nerve, and it will stop the parasympathetic action. So the sympathetic action 
that causes dilatation of the pupils is not opposed anymore. So if you see a discrepancy between the pupil, for example, the left pupil is like this, fully dilated, and the right one is small and responding to light, you should immediately assume that there is an intracranial hemorrhage, most probably epidural, that's, that's constricting and causing pressure on the third oculomotor nerve, and this is very, very corrected with surgery. With prognosis, you go, the neurosurgeon will do craniectomy, evacuate the blood, relieve the pressure, and the patient usually does well. These are penetrating injuries to the head. They are uncommon. Uh, the same principle applies to any head injury. Will you pull this out? Never pull out any penetrating object from anywhere in the body until you are ready. And that definitely applies to the chest and the abdomen. Unless you are in the operating room with a full team around you, anesthesia, everything. Never do that. Now, see, these are the things that you, you and I can do before we get to the trauma center. <coughs> Barbiturates, hypertonic saline, mannitol, hyperventilation, anticonvulsant, just to try to maintain the best oxygenation we can to the brain, minimize the intracranial pressure, and prevent any seizure activity until the trauma center will take over. Which you might add that hypertonic saline, there has been a lot of discussion about I think you will. You will start carrying it. Does everybody know what hypertonic saline is? The three percent. It's it's actually been proven that it's better than mannitol because it doesn't drop the blood pressure. Okay. Quickly, we'll jump to the thoracic trauma. Only 10% of thoracic trauma and 20% are blunt, and 20% of penetrating thoracic trauma require a surgeon. Just think about it. 80% of thoracic injuries can be managed non-surgically. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very important. You can manage it even in a, in a small town, if you have somebody who knows, to differentiate what needs to go to the trauma center and what doesn't. Uh, maybe the most important thing is, from your standpoint, is tension pneumothorax. Uh, tension pneumothorax basically can be diagnosed clinically. Uh, you, you, you don't need to wait for a chest x-ray. Uh, tell me what, what will the patient show or an examination if you have a tension pneumothorax. Give, give me one. One, second, absent breath sounds. Is that correct? So the treatment here is basically you have to put a, a needle or a chest tube to drain the air. And many of you will do the needle. Uh, pneumothorax, non-tension pneumothorax is very difficult to diagnose. And whether it's 5%, 10%, 20%, very difficult. Sometimes we don't see it on chest CT, on uh, chest X-ray, but we see it on CT. And the days before CT, then we must have missed so many pneumothoraces. But from my experience, a pneumothorax that is not tension is not that important. So I'm not sure what to advise you about the needle. You can help some people with the needle, but if there's no tension, I don't think you're helping them that much. I have had to see some patients coming to me where we think the needle has caused an pneumothorax. It was assumed to be an pneumothorax. I know one of, our par one of my partners doesn't like the needle at all, uh, to be inserted. But there is also always room for it. Now, where are you going to put this needle? Can I ask you, anybody? Second, how do you, how do you know this is a second drip? I'll show, I'll show you an easier technique. That's very difficult from here between the clavicle and the first rib. This is the sternal notch. Put it between your sternal notch. Go down just about one inch. You will feel a prominence. This is the sternal angle. This is the sternal notch, about an inch or three centimeters below the sternal angle. Move to the side of the sternal notch. You will find you feel a bone. This is the second rib. This is the second rib. Just below it is the second intercostal space. So this is what I would do. I would go to this angle here. This is the sternal angle. Go down a three centimeter sternal notch. 
This is the second rib. This is the third rib. This is the second intercostal space. The second intercostal space between two and three. The third between three and four. <coughs> Midclavicular line. I will feel the, the, the bone. Now I have to go in this space. Now, I would like to go at the top of the third rib. Why? What are the structures? What is the neurovascular bundle there? Artery? Artery, vein, and nerve. You know the, do you know how anatomically they are positioned? They are under the rib. In what order? Now you will know. There's something called van. Remember the word van. This is the rib. This is the vein. This is the artery. And this is the nerve. So when I go to put some form of intercostal blocking agent, I will hit the bone. I will pull and head, go downwards. Get to the bundle. I will aspirate before I inject anything. Make sure I'm not in a vein or an artery, and I would infiltrate a bit of marking. And it used to be, in Europe, much more common in the United States during this procedure. Patient with rib pain, multiple rib fractures, cannot breathe because of the pain, cannot cough. It would be amazing what, what marking will do. It'll give you a 12-hour period of relief. You can breathe, you can cough, you can work better with the incentive spirometer. So the message here is VAN, V-A-N, intercostal bundle, vein, artery, nerve, underneath the rib. Okay, tension pneumothorax. You brought the patient for me with a, with a needle. I will change that needle to a tube, chest tube. Has anybody put a chest tube? Maybe you are not allowed to put a chest tube. I don't know, but I can tell you how you should put a chest tube. In Europe, there is more, they don't mind putting a chest tube anteriorly exactly where you go with your needle, second intercostal space, especially for a pneumothorax. They go in and then aim it to the apex, they hit the apex, they pull one centimeter, they fix it in position. Usually they do it in males, not in, me in females, for cosmetic purposes. In the United States, we prefer the axillary approach. So if you are in a position, you have to put a chest tube, and if you diagnose a pneumothorax, I find no reason why you shouldn't put it if you go between the anterior axillary line and the middle axillary line at the nipple level which is usually the fifth intercostal space, between the fifth and the sixth rib. There are no important structures there that you can cause damage with. But you have to make an incision at least two centimeters. Okay. Sometimes I get patients from our institution, sometimes from my own ED, my own colleagues in the emergency department putting a chest tube. They, they have an incision about six centimeters, which drives me crazy. And then they put the chest tube here, and they have put all sutures here to close this incision. Two centimeters is the maximum, you don't need more. You, uh, you cut the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, you start with either a hemostat or a scissors, cut and spread until you reach the rib. And then you go above the rib. When you feel the rib, you go above it. Again, you are trying to avoid the neurovascular bundle. And although there are techniques where you can put a trocar, this should be done only by very experienced people who have put hundreds and thousands of chest tubes. For somebody like you, open this space, and even you can introduce your finger inside. Make sure there are no adhesion or anything, and then guide the tube there. Now, we put chest tube for pneumothorax, we put chest tube for hemothorax. There's a big difference how you're going to position the tube. I grew up in a, in, in a third world country where we did not have much equipment, so we have to make the most of it. So I will go through the 6th or 7th intercostal space, lower down, if I have a hemo-pneumothorax, and I will put the tube down and guide it all the way to the apex, make sure that my tube has some holes in it, that it can drain the air from the apex and the same thing, blood from here. But here, many times, we find ourselves putting two chest tubes, one for the pneumothorax and one for the hemothorax. There are some nice curved chest tubes that not many people use, but they are wonderful because they can go to the costophrenic angle or the cardiophrenic angle and, and drain the whole pleural space, all those angles. So, and, and chest tube, the other thing I want to tell you about chest tube, when you, when you put them, you have to fix them with something in position. I like to fix them, this is my incision. 
I like to put a stitch in this position, a U-shaped incision or inverted U-shape. Use this stitch to fix the tube, but also put only one knot and then go around the tube and put the, max, the other knot about this far from the skin. The reason I do that is that when the time comes to remove the chest tube, and usually it's two to three days, I can divide that little knot that I put far away from the skin and use the same suture that I inserted to close the hole. I have seen a lot of people putting in new sutures or not putting any sutures. You can do that. I'd like to put a stitch and close the hole, but I'll make sure that the stitch will be removed maybe second or third day. I don't want to leave it for a long time. The reason for that, there is a high risk of infection and a lot of edema. And I've seen patients coming to me two weeks, three weeks later to the trauma clinic for some reason. The knot is still there and the area is very hyperemic and swollen and infected. That's another practical point. Okay. So, tension pneumothorax. Okay, one more thing. You were very good. You answered all the tension pneumothorax. Perfect. How do you differentiate between tension pneumothorax and pericardial tamponade? Just by looking at me. Okay, look at me. I have pericardial tamponade. What is the first thing that you're going to notice? Tell me more about the veins in my neck. Pericardial tamponade. Works as JVD. JVD. <laughs> elevated. <laughs> but you said to me with tension pneumothorax, they are also elevated. Okay. So, what are we dealing with now? Are you dealing with a tension pneumothorax or a pericardial tamponade? The reason I'm asking you is the management is completely different. There isn't. Yeah, you can get pulses paradoxes with the pericardial tamponade, but not always is there. Narrowing pulse pressures, this is the heart zones, or just... Muffled heart zones, sometimes you can detect them, sometimes you cannot. Sometimes muffled heart sounds are there, but we cannot hear them in the trauma bay, everybody's screaming, 20 people around you. There's one, one simple thing that you alluded to earlier. Breast sounds? Breast sounds. Attention, pneumothorax, no breath sounds, but pericardial tamponade, there is breath sounds. Very important. And very important differentiation because the management is completely different that I will show you. This is, a, this is an open pneumothorax. We don't see them as frequently as we used to. Until the time you can come and put a chest tube, this is what you need to do. Some sterile dressing, three-quarter, allow a valve so that little air will go in and air will go out. Uh, not to build the tension in the thorax, sir. Didn't that the is there any reason to needle an open thorax? The reason for what? To do a thoracotomy on an open pneumothorax or just if it was dressing? Dressing will do because air is coming out. Yeah. Air is coming out. This will need a chest tube and a closure of this open wound, definitely. But this is the way to do it. And the reason you leave one quarter open is to allow a valve effect where little bubble go, little air will go in and air can exit. They don't need. Okay, this is the uh, rib fractures. And the reason I'm showing it is that there is a term called flail chest. And flail chest, by definition, is what? Three or more. Anybody else? Three or more consecutive ribs broken at the time. Okay. Flail chest, to me, is when I'm watching somebody breathing. Take a deep breath, sir. Look, his chest is up. If he had a flail chest, his chest would go down with inspiration and would go up with expiration. Completely the opposite way. This is a flail chest clinically. It might happen, you might see it clinically, you might not see it. You might see it with people who have rib fractures, uh, and you sometimes rib fractures you not see it. But usually it happens in people who have fractured their rib in more than one position. Multiple ribs and in more than one position, usually in two different positions. This is what basically it means. Now, this is what I want to show you, and I will come to it at the end. This is one of the advances in surgery that happened in the past few years. For a long time, we did not pay attention to rib fractures and their management. Was, what's more important to us was the lung underneath the ribs. The patient will be ventilated, we'll have pulmonary toilet, we'll have bronchoscopy, we'll have all the suctioning out of the sputum, we'll have antibiotic as needed. But there's about 10% of patients with rib fractures 
and usually multiple rib fractures that will have such a severe pain that nothing is, is helping them. And we found that those people who we manage without plating them eventually will be okay. They can be discharged, but very, very few, maybe 1% of them, will go back to functioning life, will go back to a job or anything. Most of them will be finished, no more work. So this is a new concept now where we played those ribs and it has helped a lot of people. I have recently had a patient who was willing to go back to work, cannot wait to go back to work, but he was in such severe pain that he was on a large amount of narcotics. When we plated him, he was a completely different person. The pain has gone and he's back at work. And this is one of the advantages. There are two companies in the United States that does this. This is one of them. This is one by Synthes. Uh, I use this. One of my partners, Dr. Maybert, used the other group. The other group. And you don't have to play every, every rib. Sometimes you play every other rib. Uh, and the idea behind it is to stabilize the chest wall and minimize the pain so that those, work, those people can ambulate, can breathe, can cough, and have a normal life. This is the uh, tamponade, and this is an echocardiogram showing you, uh, this is right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, and this is the pericardial sac, and this is the effusion. Uh, this is a subcostal view. And this is very important if you make a diagnosis of that, usually the patient is hypotensive. The pulses paradoxes that you mentioned, the muffled heart sounds, uh, they might be there, they might not be there. But if you have something like that in the emergency department, I'm sure the emergency room doctor will always put a needle. It has to be maybe at least six inches in length so that it can reach. Uh, it can um, uh, gauge 16 or 18 and even sometimes aspirating only 5 cc's of blood, only 5 cc's will, will stop the, the tamponade. The tamponade, what it does basically, it prevents venous drainage back to the heart from the IVC, the inferior vena cava. Now, this, this diagram here, and I have done definitely this before, is somebody trying to get to this space. But this is a blind procedure, and they recommend you go in the lower end of the sternum, just to the left of the sternum, and you aim towards the right shoulder or the tip of the right scapula, and you advance. But sometimes, sometimes my needle, sometimes my needle will go and touch the ventricle wall. And that's why we recommend when you do this procedure, you have an EKG monitoring, so you get a change in the QRS complex. And when you, know, when you, when you get that, you immediately know that you need to pull back a little bit, get back into this space, and aspirate. Is the question I have for you now, is this a temporary or a permanent cure of pericardial tamponade? Just aspirate. What else needs to be done? Surgery. Sometimes this is not successful. We can do a small incision in the lower end of the sternum. We, we call it a pericardial window. Once you open the sternum there, you will see the lower end, the inferior surface of the right ventricle. And if you make a little cut there in the pericardium, you can, next step will be the pericardial tamponade and you to, immediately distant to it is the wall of the right ventricle. So if you let, make a little window by making even a one centimeter incision in the pericardium, you can drain that blood. The other thing that I forgot to mention is once you do the needle here, please leave the cannula in. Tape it with a steady strip to the chest wall. Don't, don't remove it completely until you have a permanent, you are in a trauma center where somebody can take care of it. Even the pericardial window that I mentioned through an incision in the lower sternum is not is also a temporary measure. This patient will definitely need to go to the operating room either to have a median sternotomy or a left thoracotomy to deal with the problem. And the problem is usually bleeding from the heart itself that needs to be dealt with. Okay. We talked about that quickly. Uh, now, th this, this was a very important slide before CT came and everything. 
And I, as a young doctor, I was very much interested, and I went uh, and spent some time with the, one of the radiologists who taught me how to read a chest X-ray. And, and I just want to give you a to make you more knowledgeable in reading a chest X-ray. Uh, basically, you have to have a, some system to read it. And usually, there are those guys recommend with looking at the bones first. You look, these are the clavicle. You go like that, and superior, inferior border, same like that, looking for a fracture. You count the ribs first, second, third, fourth. This is not very clear X-ray, but that's the way to do it. Then you look at the cardiophrenic angles, there's any fluid there, the costophrenic angles. Uh, these are the aortopulmonary window, left pulmonary artery, ascending aorta, the descending aorta. This is the diaphragm. Why is this side higher than this side? Can anybody tell me the diaphragm? Liver. There's a liver underneath here. And that's why traumatic rupture of the diaphragm is one of the conditions that is usually missed, and you have to have a high suspicion for them, are more common on the left side than on the right, because the right side is protected by the liver. Here you have the spleen, which is much less firm than the liver. So just looking at the chest x-ray, you can have a lot of, you can see if there's any pneumothorax, hemothorax. Uh, and the other thing that's important is the mediastinum. The mediastinum should be right in the midline here. And sometimes you have a mediastinum going to one side. You always assume that it was pushed by either a tension pneumothorax or a hemothorax that goes here. But sometimes you find the mediastinum going this way, and there is no tension pneumothorax or tension hemothorax that pushed it. Can somebody tell me what is the commonest cause of the mediastinum being shifted to one side without evidence of tension nemo or tension hemo? The answer to that is usually a plug, a sputum plug that has blocked the left side so there is no air going to the left side and the mediastinum shift to the side that has the problem. And the treatment for that condition is a bronchoscopy. You suck the secretions out and the lung will inflate. The other common thing, common thing that you encounter is when you intubate somebody and it goes in the right main. We, you all know that. And all you have to do is pull the endotracheal tube two to three centimeters. That's a very common thing. In the old days, when we did not have a CT scan, when we have descending aorta transection, there used to be a lot of findings that are characteristic on the chest next side. The mediastinum will go this way if you have a nasogastric tube. You find it this way because of the hematoma here that is built by the transection of the aorta. Usually at the level of the left subclavian vein, you see some notching on the ribs in coarctation of the aorta. So the, the, there was an art in reading the chest x-ray that is not there anymore simply because the CT scan is a much better examination. This is, I mentioned quickly rib plating to minimize the pain. Not every patient is ideal for rib plating. This is something called an onq pump. You can see there's a bulb here that has a bubivacaine in it and this catheter. And we insert those catheters usually somewhere here and we go vertical to the fascia, and then we go 90 degrees and advance all the way. And the catheter has side holes, and usually they stay there for about three to five days and bathe the whole neurovascular bundles on both sides with bubivacaine. This, this, can contain, this container can take 300 or 500 cc's of local anesthetic. This is something we are using on the floor. Some, some, of, some of us are using it in a post-surgery, abdominal wound, we put them catheters. And we found that people who are having this system are requiring less narcotics. It's important for us that the patient have less narcotics because they are addictive, they give you constipation, uh, you are most of the time sleepy, unable to work with us. We want you to have to work, to, get amb to ambulate quickly, to work with an ascendance parameter. All this fact that we are losing them. So I favor this technique and it's not very difficult to insert. A lot of my colleagues, general surgeons, after a difficult laparotomy, will put them on the rectus sheath on both sides, and we notice that there's a big difference. Patients are ambulating earlier, requiring less pain medication, and establishing GI continuity quickly and being discharged earlier. Uh, this is just a chest tube. One thing practical I want to tell you about chest tube 
you can see that the chest tube here have holes here. And sometimes if you look at the chest x-ray, because the tube was pulled for some reason or the other, moving the patient, some of those holes are within the chest wall. If that happens, then the chest wall either has to be pushed back or pulled. Because if you have a side hole within the chest wall, you will be getting air through that side hole from outside into the lung. That's very important. If you look at it, confirm it. And some patients might not have, might, uh, might have a chest tube, but still not enough. They are still having a pneumothorax or still having a hemothorax. They might require another chest tube. This is going right to the apex. They might, if there is blood here in the left costophrenic angle, they might need another chest tube here. There is one condition that is not common, rare, but we definitely have had a few cases at St. Alphonsus, where the patient comes and I put a chest tube and there is a massive air leak. And sometimes I say, okay, maybe we need another chest tube. We put another chest tube and still there is massive air leak. What does massive air leak after one chest tube or two chest tube should alert you to? What can be going on? Anybody? It's a rare condition. If there is a tear in the bronchus, and usually the tear in the bronchus happens very close to the carina. This is the carina. This is the right main bronchus, left main bronchus. It's usually in this area. This. And if there is a tear there, no matter how many chest tubes you're going to insert, there will still be an air leak. So this patient will need bronchoscopy. A few years ago, I was in the intensive care unit, and one of my partners, who is not with us anymore, has admitted a 15-year-old boy who had a chest tube. And there was, I was told by the intensivist that there's a massive air leak by the chest tube. Can you come and help me or see what's going on? Another chest tube was inserted. There was still massive air tube, massive air leak. So um, the intensivist decided that he's going to bronchoscope the patient. And he went there and he was bronchoscoping the patient and he said to me, George, I don't know what I'm looking at. I, I, he was lost. He, he's a pulmonologist and a very experienced doctor. And what has happened, The patient had a, a, a hole here, and he went with the bronchoscope through this hole. And he was looking at something that did not make any sense to him, because he was looking for cartilage, for bronchus, for something. He was looking at the mediastinum. I came and looked at him, and I said, you're looking at the mediastinum here anymore. This patient has bronchial tear. We made the diagnosis. We confirmed the diagnosis with bronchoscopy. We contacted the cardiac surgeon in our department. That particular case, the surgeon did not want to operate, and that patient was sent to Seattle, had surgery that night, and came six weeks later with his family to our intensive care unit to say thank you. Rare condition can happen even in the back of your mind. Okay. These are just the system that we use. There are different systems here. I can tell you there's air leak or there isn't. Uh, how much blood you are losing per particular time. I myself always find myself in a situation where the chest tube, I go to examine the patient that had the pneumothorax and I put a chest tube. A time will come where we need to make a decision. Are we going to take just this chest tube out or not? So what are the criteria that we follow? I go there and ask the patient to take deep breaths or cough. I will look at the swing in the column. If there is air leak, the patient is still not ready. If there's only a swing but no air leak, it's 50-50 situation. One of the techniques that I use, I clamp the chest tube. Not many people are happy to do that. I clamp the chest tube, but I will tell the nurse on the floor responsible for that patient, if the patient complains of chest pain or shortness of breath, all you have to do is unclamp it. In fact, I have worked in hospitals in England and here where a patient is transferred to me from another hospital. And this is a true story, I'm not exaggerating. With a chest trauma, with a chest tube in. A patient arrives to my institution with a chest tube clamped. Why? Why do you put a chest tube and then clamp it? Never clamp a chest tube when you are transporting a patient. Never. It can save lives. 
So when I come here and assess the situation, the nurse knows. And then I'd like an hour later or two hours later with, the, with my chest tube clamp to obtain a chest x-ray. If there is the rim of pneumothorax that was there before and still there, hasn't gone worse, I'm happy to remove the chest tube and send the patient home. Because those patients, every day we around, they tell us, when am I going home? When are you going to send me home? They are bored, sitting there doing nothing. They are not on suction anymore, they are on water seal, and we have to make a decision. This is one way of doing this technique. Do we, do we succeed in 100% of the cases? No, I would say 90%, but I think it's still a, 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 good, a good way to go. The, for blood, you have to decide. Most of us will accept a drainage less than 100 cc of blood or fluid per day for discharging the patient and removing the chest tube. Okay, a few more things I want to tell you about the thorax uh, uh, that before I move to the abdomen. There are other injuries of the thorax that can happen. Esophageal rupture, extremely uncommon, always suspected when there's a pleural effusion on the left side. If you miss it, the patient can easily have mediastinitis and go into septic shock. You have to diagnose it early. And the earlier you diagnose it, you put a chest tube, you confirm it with a gastrographic to make sure where is the leak, and then surgery is the way to go. If, the, if you have received a patient late, Maybe surgery is not the way to go. You put a chest tube, a fluid, and antibiotics, and stabilize the patient, and the patient will need surgery at a later time. Either you close the hole, or you resect, or many times you close the hole and bring the stomach to reinforce it, to, to stop it. It's a very uncommon condition, but a lethal condition. We have to have high suspicion of it. The other condition that is uh, that uh, we can easily miss is diaphragmatic rupture. Uh, a fuzzy x-ray, especially on the left costophrenic angle, you're not sure is this fluid or anything, you have to go and do a CT scan, talk to your radiologist, make sure. If you see an air there in the left pleural space, but it's not pneumothorax, you have always to suspect either a stomach or a loop of small bowel or a loop of large bowel has gone up through the, the rent in the diaphragm and sitting in the left pleural space, that's, that's the problem, and compressing the lung. And this is a surgical condition where you have to go through the abdomen usually, pull the contents back to the peritoneal cavity and repair the rent in the diaphragm. Usually it's secondary to a blunt injury. It can happen with a penetrating injury. The best way to diagnose it now is laparoscopy. Although very rarely we do laparoscopy on trauma patients because of the urgency of the situation, if the patient is stable, you can put the laparoscope through a tiny incision like we are doing for removing the appendix or the gallbladder and look at the diaphragm. Uh, you can have a much better view because even with the open abdomen, assessing the diaphragm is not easy. You cannot even see it. Sometimes you have to run, just run your... Again, the left side is more common than the right because the right is protected by the uh, liver. I had two cases in my career that I always remember. When I was in England, I got a patient referred to me from another hospital where left-sided pneumothorax was diagnosed and they put a chest tube and they send the patient to our center. Luckily with the chest tube, not clamped. <laughs> so I remember going to see the patient and I looked at the container and always look. It's, it's, you underestimate the, the, the value of looking, of observing, of uh, palpating, of auscultation, of percussion. It's, it's, it's the basic of medicine, but it's amazing how much knowledge you can get from it. Uh, I will divert just a little bit. When I came to the United States in 1992, I came as an international cardiac surgery fellow, and my station was St. Vincent in Portland, Oregon. And I remember the first week I walked into the intensive care unit, and I saw those all lovely American nurses, all stationed around a center in the middle of the ICU, looking at monitors. And they were great experts in identifying ventricular tachycardia, supraventricular rhythm. And I came from England, and there the emphasis was completely on the patient. But the technology in this country was so advanced that it sort of, people, a lot of them forgot the ABC of medicine. Many of them will not examine or listen to the patient or anything. But see, between the CT scan and the monitoring that we had here, we forgot the ABC of medicine. Now I think it's slowly coming back as we are ordering definitely less tests. But that was my impression the first week. So let me go back on that case. 
I looked at what's coming out, and what was coming out was neither air nor blood. It looked like a yellowish fluid. It, it didn't make much sense to me. So I, we did a CT scan and went back. And what has happened in that particular case, the patient had a left diaphragmatic rupture. And the stomach was up in the chest. And the stomach has air. It was mistaken for a left pneumothorax. So somebody in the previous hospital put a chest tube into the stomach to drain that air. And when the patient came to me, he was draining hydrochloric acid through the chest tube. So the patient went to the operating room, laparotomy, the stomach was pulled, was repaired, the diaphragmatic rupture, and the patient did well. Uh, I have seen chest tube and liver. I have missed the spleen by half, a, half, maybe two to three millimeters myself in trying to be a perfectionist to drain a pleural space right at the base and the spleen is sitting here and my tube was above the spleen and below the diaphragm. I remember very well putting that and my, my, my chief at the time was laughing saying how lucky I was that I did hit the spleen. Uh, Dr. Casos was one of my ex-partners, he's not with us, a few, uh, maybe a year, two years ago, gave a lecture at St. Alphonsus, and he reviewed some of the literature about chest tube, and he showed some x-rays in the stomach, in the colon, in the small bowel, in the heart, and the liver. So you have to be very careful and know your anatomy very well, and I, there's no substitute for counting the ribs. Counting the ribs. It can be very, in women with breast, it can be even more difficult. In children and babies, it's even more difficult. You have to have an anatomical landmark before you decide where to go. Okay. Uh, how are we doing for time? Hmm? Okay. Abdomen. The reason I put this slide anatomy of the abdomen. I want to remind everybody that the abdomen doesn't end here. When you took a nice, very nice breath for me earlier, can you exhale? exhale. In, out. Okay. In again. Yeah. The, the abdomen basically is covered by half of the thorax here. The abdomen can reach up to the level of the nipples. The liver, the spleen, the stomach can be in that, and many people forget that. Uh, I remember a case where there was a big knife that came here just under the sternum uh, in one of the places that I was working, and the cardiothoracic surgeon was contacted because they thought this, this definitely through the heart, it turned out to be in the stomach. Uh, it depends what, what during inspiration or expiration it was taken. Between the anterior axillary line and the posterior axillary line, there is like a one and a half inch, three, four centimeter area from here, from the iliac crest to the axilla. This is all considered part of the flank. And there are very important structures there that people very much miss. A knife in that area can easily hit the kidney or the colon. That's another important part. Now, the abdomen is made of really two compartments. One is the peritoneal cavity. What is the second one? Retroperitoneum. Did anybody say retroperitoneum? You? Again? Okay. Wow. Nobody wants to take the next answer. The next question. So my question is here, what, what lives in the retroperitoneum? Can anybody tell me what are the structures in the retroperitoneum? One? Pancreas. Next. Part of the duodenum. It's third and fourth part of the duodenum, and the pancreas live there. Aorta, inferior vena cava, adrenal glands. Very important structure of the retroperitoneum that we forget about. And many times we have blood there that we don't see. In fact, there are five places where you can lose blood. You should be very experienced with the first place. Where is it? Huh? No? You, you, are, you are the first responders. Street. On the street. <laughs> Number one, on the street, you lose blood. You have, it's your job to come and tell me, and I appreciate what you come and tell me there was, you described the accident for me. Why is it important that you describe the accident for me? 
mechanism of injury can tell me a lot of what to look for. A deacceleration injury, I can suspect an injury to the aorta at the ligamentous level. I expect seat belt injury can tell me a lot of information. Tell me the patient went into severe flexion with a seat belt injury. I immediately assume there is a mesenteric injury there. There's a chance fracture, fracture of the body of the L1. So I, I appreciate your report you described to me. <coughs> it's so nice to have somebody from you go in and show me an x-ray of, of the car, of the damage, of the intrusion in the car, uh, stealing wheel injury, because I can anticipate why, why the acceleration of injuries are important. Because different parts of the body move at different speed. It's, it's a differential. The spleen and the liver are injured because they move. And when suddenly they stop, they will continue with the acceleration, and they are held by some ligaments. The, the spleen has a lot of ligaments around it, so is the liver. They will try to stop them, but they move faster than the ligaments, and then you have the shearing force during this differential and the speed and cause the tearing process. So it's important what you tell me. So these are the things. The other places, we talked about this, this three. What other places? Somebody said the pelvis. That's the second place where I look for blood. Third place. Street, pelvis. Third place where there might be a large amount of blood. Pleural space. Pleural space. Next. The peritoneal cavity, including the peritoneum and the retroperitoneum. And the fifth one that many people miss, huh? you are very close, the thighs. It's, it's amazing what the thigh, you can bleed two liters of blood in each thigh. Two liters, you have five liters, if you bleed two here and two here, you're done, you are a stage four shock. What is the definition of shock? Anybody? Sir? Yeah, inadequate perfusion of tissues. It's not hypotension. That's definitely the case. Not hypotension. Is that a problem? I don't have a slide for that, but talking about shock, there's four stages of shock. We call them stage one, two, three, and four. It all depends on the amount of blood loss and the percentage. The first one is stage one. You lose up to 750 cc's of blood like me donating a unit of blood, or a unit and a half of blood. What, what, what effects do, will happen to me? You're shaking your head, nothing. I agree with you, nothing. You are a healthy individual, you lose 750 cc of blood, this is stage one, class one of shock. You're not tachycardic, you're not hypotensive, you might be a bit dry, they might, they, after you go to the blood place where you donate, they will give you some uh, chocolates and an orange drink and uh, make you happy and then you go and drive and that's it. Come back in 56 days and give us another transfusion. Okay. So stage two. You've lost now 1,000, up to 1,500 cc's of blood, which is 15 to... Let me see in terms of percentage. So, yeah, you lost 700 to 1,500 cc's of blood, which is about... 30% now of your cardiac output. What do you have clinically? Huh? Anything else? What's happened to your blood pressure? That's the most important. That's the lesson of the day there. Tachycardia is much more sensitive than blood pressure changes. You can still maintain a reasonable blood pressure with losing 1,500 cc's of blood, but you are tachycardic. Then you go to stage three, you've lost now 1,500 to 2,000, and you are start getting confused, and the stage four, where you are really lethargic and you are very close to death, if nothing has happened to it. So now it's our job to identify, your job is to give the patient fluid and blood if you can, and soon you're going to have blood products, because the company is going towards blood products, plasma, uh, platelets, fresh frozen plasma, and these are showing to be more important than giving blood. And this is coming, definitely. Like the TXA that Pat is going to talk about is going to be very likely part of the thing that you are going to use. Because the earlier we act, and this is the experience from the military, the earlier we act and give blood products, the better the outcome. So these are the stages of, uh, we talked about the abdomen, the stages of shock quickly. Uh, there is blunt and penetrating injury. There is a big difference between low velocity and high velocity. Blast injuries, I just mentioned it there. Luckily, we don't see much of it because not much we can do. 
one of my partners, Dr. Morgan, has, gives always a very nice lecture about blast injuries. If you have a chance, try to attend it. Uh, these are the seat belt injuries that are very common and have to be taken very, very seriously. Many times, those patients go to the CT as an initial evaluation, and the CT of the abdomen is normal. But those guys need to be admitted and need to be examined on a regular basis because many of them will have a perforation, 6 hours, 12 hours, and, and I, I would see those guys every 2 to 3 hours, and I would make sure the nurse knows that there's any change that I should be paged, and I go and examine them. And initially, you don't have any peritoneal signs. You don't feel any rigidity. In fact, you can lose a large amount of blood over a liter in your abdomen, and still the abdomen looks great. The only thing that you might, on examination, notice is that there are no bowel tones, because the body will go into ileus in response to the blood. But it will still be solved. They will not be complaining of blood. But this is something that you have to remember. One of the advances in, in, in medicine, and in trauma, and in emergency room, uh, has been FAST. Like, what is FAST? F-A-S-T. Anybody? I don't know what you just understand for it, but the ultrasound. It is the ultrasound. And our ER doctors over the years have become more and more experienced, and we rely on them to give us a report. FAST stands for Focal Assessment Sonography of Trauma, F-A-S-T. And it's a very simple test because it's a non-invasive test. And many times when the patient comes to the trauma bay, you will see our ER doctors ready with their machine ultrasound, and they will be looking at four different compartments. I think I have a slide for that, so let me move a little bit. This is usually a flexion injury, and you have to take it very seriously. It's usually associated with a chance fracture, which is a fracture of the L1 body. Does anybody know chance? Is it a chance like luck? Chance actually is an English surgeon who described the condition. It's called chance fracture. These are the deacceleration injuries that worries me a lot. This is a fall. These are the commonest causes mechanism of trauma that we encounter in Idaho. So that's why it's important because it can identify potential injuries. And I rely on you to tell me and describe this for me because it's very important. Now we come to something very important that you are, I think, more experienced than I am in doing, intubating people. I've always said, and tell my children when they complain that life is not fair. You have to accept that in life. It's not fair. And it's always not fair that you guys do the most difficult cases and intubate the most difficult patients. And our anesthesiologists who have gone to medical school and anesthesia programs do the nicest cases when the patient comes on the table. There is light. There is an assistant. There is all the instruments they want. They oxygenate the patient. They have five minutes to decide to put the endotracheal tube or not. If it is difficult, they have the bougie and the bronchoscope and a relaxed atmosphere. And we are surgeons scrub and waiting to say, oh, come on, let's get on with it. So life is not fair, but you are having those cases. And I told you earlier when I talked about head injury how important it is that you oxygenate the patient. Somebody with a GCS uh, 8 and below cannot protect their airway. You're going to intubate them. You're going to do the difficult job. You, you all know about the jaw lift and the chin thrust and the bagging and everything, and you have to intubate. And you've done that, but sometimes successfully, not, sometimes not very successfully. And there are difficult mouths and different, different anatomy and people with short, uh, uh, obese necks and things like that. So when you open their mouth and you only see the uvula, or the base of it, you realize you're going to have a difficult intubation. The only thing I can suggest to you, and I don't do these things, I do the surgical airways, is that have something like this. I love this instrument. It's a bougie. Look at the tip of it, how it's angulated anteriorly. If you find yourself oxygenating the patient, and now your sets are in the high 90s, 100, you have at least three minutes to work with. You cannot see the cords. How about a bougie that goes blindly, and then the tip of it is very likely going to go through the cords because the trachea is in front of the esophagus. And you should do that, and then you slide the endotracheal tube over the bougie, the gum elastic bougie, very important. And then you can confirm, listening to the chest, make sure there's airway, look at the ex exhalation of CO2, put it in the epigastrium, make sure there's no air going into the stomach when somebody is inflating. This is just something, a suggestion. From my standpoint, this is the LMA, 
that I'm sure you have used. Now I, I notice there is something called the ILMA. Are you familiar with it? Somebody said that you can intubate through it. I have no experience. It was news to me when I read it in the ATLS manual. So I cannot comment on that. Now let me tell you about something that I do. The patient comes with facial trauma. You open their mouth, it's all blood. Blood coming from everywhere. The patient would come with burns, inhalation burns. Everything is black, carbonaceous material coming out, carbon deposits. Uh, an attempt was made by you, unsuccessful. An attempt was made by our ED doctor, unsuccessful. Anesthesia come, unsuccessful. The bougie was not going nowhere. There will come a time when I have to consider something like that. This is the surgical cricothyroidopathy. And the only way you can explain it is that you feel your own anatomy. This is the hyoid bone. Go down the string, you find Adam's apple, the thyroid cartilage. Just below it, you can feel another cartilage called the cricoid cartilage. The membrane that we are interested in is here, between the cricoid and the uh, between the hyoid and the cricoid is the cricothyroid thy membrane. <coughs> You make an incision there. Look, at this incision is vertical. This is the head, this is the chin. Some people will make transverse incision. The people who want to make vertical incision, they will tell you we are not very happy with transverse incision because there is an anterior jugular veins here and here so that we don't divide them. But the incision should not be more than 1.5 centimeter. And it's very easy by vibration. You feel this membrane, you make a nick in it with a knife, and then you spread the hemostat in both directions. And then you can use <coughs> through here, you can put an endotracheal tube size 6 or tracheostomy tube, and that will buy you a lot of time. Now, some people have used a needle through this membrane. I haven't done it before. They claim they can buy about four, buy 45 minutes with a jet ventilation until you have time to get to the hospital and do. Now, this is also a temporary procedure because once this comes and stabilize the patient, we may extend the incision a bit more and do a formal tracheostomy through the second ring of the trachea. But this is, can be a life saving. And if you go to do the ATLS course, they were, in the past we used to do it on animals, now we can do it on dummies, where they make you feel this and make an incision and go through it and dilate it. It's a very simple procedure. And there's nothing, no structures of importance around that you can cause damage. This is the formal tracheostomy. Let me tell you a note about tracheostomy. Uh, up till 19, 2008, I was doing tracheostomy in the operating room. Uh, between 2001 to 2005, formal tracheostomy. Between 2005 to 2008, I would use a, a technique where I would use dilators, but still in the operating room. From 2008, we started doing a percutaneous tracheostomy. And a percutaneous tracheostomy means you have to have two surgeons or two doctors that are familiar with the procedure. This is the trachea, for example. You have to have somebody with a bronchoscope that usually goes through the endotracheal tube. Those guys are usually done on trauma patients that will need, that have failed to, to get extubated. So with the, bron with the bronchoscope coming here, and the light will be shining at the lower end of the neck here. You have to see the light. We dim the lights in the room. We sometimes put a bag in this position, vertical position behind, so that we can drop the shoulders, extend the neck. And I go just about a finger breadth above the sternal angle here, but I have to see the light. I'll make an incision, maybe about a centimeter and a half to two centimeters, and follow the light, divide the subcutaneous tissue, just spread them a little bit, and put a needle. I have a monitor that I look at, and the light is coming through the bronchoscope that my partner has passed through here. And I cannulate the trachea under vision. I'm looking at the monitor, and I see my needle going into the trachea. Once I do that, I can dilate the track and then put a tracheostomy tube over by the guiding wire. And then the bronchoscope will be removed from the endotracheal tube and inserted through the tracheostomy on the end that I'm in the trachea, and there's no complication and no bleeding. And most of the time, we do some suctioning, and most of the time, there's some secretions in both bronchial tree. So this procedure has saved us a lot of time. We don't now need to go to the operating room. We do this in the, on the, in the ICU usually. But it requires two surgeons, a bronchoscope, and a monitor with very good results. Uh, 
trauma of the abdomen, the commonest organs that are injured in the abdomen is the spleen. Uh, there has been a lot of changes in the past 20 years. 20 years ago, if there's injury to the spleen and it's bleeding, the patient goes to the operating room, have the spleen out, the spleen is in the bucket within half an hour. Nowadays, we do a CT scan. If there's only blood around the spleen and there is no active bleeding, we take the patient to the intensive care unit, we monitor that. We do serial hemoglobin and hematocrits on them. We look at their heart rate, their blood pressure. Uh, we follow them very, very closely. If there is active bleeding and still bleeding actively and, and is substantial amount, you can go both ways. You can go either to the, emergent, to the operating room or where? You have a spleen that is bleeding. You have confirmed active extravasation from the splenic bed or branches of the splenic artery. And I'm telling you there's another place you can go, but not in the operating room. Where? Hmm? <laughs> no, not yet. You can go to intervention radiology. And this is definitely one of the advances in trauma and medicine in the past years. We have an excellent team of radiologists who can go through the femoral artery of the aorta to the branch of the spleen, splenic artery, out of the celiac plexus, and can identify those little bleeders and they can embolize them or put a coil there and stop the bleeding. And we have had reasonable success with that. And this is definitely one of the advances in trauma. Now the patients, some of them leave the hospital. The blood there usually gets absorbed. You still admit the patient, you still follow them, you still watch them, you do, do serial exam and serial hemoglobin and hematocrit on them, but you save them an operation, either laparoscopically or open technically. This is one of the advances. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't succeed. If they don't succeed and the patient still is bleeding, you go to the operating room and remove the spleen. Some people manage to remove half the spleen, or part, only the part that's bleeding. It is very difficult technically to do that, under, especially if the patient is unstable. Now, you can ask me what will happen to the spleen if part of the spleen is, is dead. Nothing. It's amazing. There's so much collateral circulation that some revascularization will take place. It's, you cannot leave a dead appendix, patient, but you can leave a dead spleen or part of a dead spleen in the human body. Same thing for kidneys. Very rarely our urologists go and remove a kidney that is bleeding from the, uh, from the patient, leaving a bit of kidney that's not functioning, telling the patient that maybe in 20, 30 years you'll have problem with hypertension secondary to this injury. We had one case about two years ago when the patient continued to bleed from the kidney despite every effort, despite intervention radiology, twice, it, it, it didn't succeed, continued to bleed. One of my partners went there with the help of a urologist and removed that kidney. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk to you about is transection of the aorta. I mentioned that earlier in the thoracic injuries. In the past, transection of the aorta was a big thing because you have to do an emergency thoracotomy. And I've done a few of this many times ago when I was doing cardiac surgery. You have to go to the clamp the aorta above and below the tear, evacuate the hematoma, and usually put an interposition graft. Nowadays, vascular surgery has advanced in such a way that they have beautiful stents that they can advance through the femoral artery up to the aorta under the effect of fluoroscopy and insert that stent inside the tear of the aorta. And we have had a few cases where we don't now call the cardiothoracic surgeon to come and call the vascular surgeon. The patient go to the catheter lab under fluoroscopy and have this procedure. Another big advance, save the patient a lot of trauma, big thoracotomy, drains, all this thing. Hmm? Yes. Uh, tracheostomy, like for trauma patients, is usually a temporary thing. Once the patient gives you access to suctioning, better uh, exchange of gases, and a few weeks' time, we don't need it anymore. We remove it, the wound closes by itself. Uh, before I jump into burns, is there anything else? One more important thing to tell you is that about there are times when the patient come in shock and bleeding, and nowadays when those patients come, active resuscitation is very important. I always tell the residents who come and work with us that I have three enemies that are fighting with me all the time in the trauma bay when you bring the patient. Can you tell me, name any of those three enemies that I have? I do everything I can to fight and try to correct before I move to the next step. 
<laughs> nurses. No, we love we love our nurses. Number one. No, the airway has been secured. The airway is your job. You've secured it, and thank you very much for doing that for me. But the emergency room doctor and myself, as a trauma surgeon, I have three things that I desperately look for and try to correct as quickly as possible because they make a big difference to the outcome. I mean, the whole idea of this teamwork is that we have a successful outcome down the line. And the enemies are, number one, I'll accept bleeding, but I will add coagulopathy. Those patients become coagulopathic, trauma. They start bleeding from every surface. The longer there is a delay, the more they are bleeding from everywhere. Things that are not surgical anymore. I cannot control by putting my hand over, or pressure, or clamp. So coagulopathy is one of them. Second, acidosis. acidosis. It's so important. Nothing functions in the body when the pH is not normal at 7.4. And number three, hypothermia. We are made for our protein and enzymes to function at a certain pH level and a certain temperature. The temperature is down, nothing worked. Nothing, there's no clots anymore. I have a patient who take them to the operating room in, 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 in an attempt to salvage them, and when I go in, everything is bleeding. Even the sutures that I have put to secure the big bleeder are bleeding on me, and I cannot do anything. Nowadays, we have some better clotting factors, this would be one of the advanced trauma that I will mention at the end of the talk. But if I correct the hypoagulopathy and the hypothermia and the acidosis, my, the chances that this patient is going to make it is much, much higher. Much higher. And this is what we do in, in the trauma bay. The temperature is what? 80 degrees? We are sweating, but for a reason. For a reason. We want to correct all these things. I don't hesitate giving fluids and bicarbonate. Although now we are ex accepting permissive hypotension. 90 systolic doesn't bother me like it used to 15 years ago. I can live with it. I can correct a few things. The other thing that is important for me is knowing the history. A lot of our patients come intubated. We have no idea who they are, what is their medical history, what's everything. I have made a point that I let my PAs go and write some orders, things like that, why I disappear, and people don't know where I disappear. They think I went to have a cup of coffee, but in reality, I'm trying to find if I can get hold of somebody related to this person. I want to know some history about the patient. There are things that I can predict if I see a big wound here or some certain holes here that the patient had some laparoscopic procedure. But I want to, to know more about them, their habits, their wishes of life. Elderly patients that come, maybe they don't want any resuscitation, they don't want intubation. The earlier I have this information, the better I can serve. Sometimes we don't get any relatives. Sometimes we can get a relative that hasn't seen the patient for years. Sometimes there is a son living in a different state. And this is what I always try to do and get that information before. So I correct all these things. Nowadays, if my patient is anticoagulation, Coumadin, and now there are other new products that we cannot uh, reverse, we have to be very cautious of how we can proceed to minimize. Patient with a head bleed on Coumadin, the INR is very high, there's no hesitation in giving vitamin K. Never give vitamin K intramuscularly. It stays in the system for a year. Give it always IV to correct the high. Fresh frozen plasma, very important. Now we have something called factor nine. K center is the new name for it. It used to be factor seven, but we found that factor seven causes maybe some myocardial irritation or infarction, so now factor nine. We are, but we, in order to give factor 9, you have to correct the platelets and give fresh frozen plasma and then give factor 9. And those guys are doing much better. There's a quick clot, like something you apply on the soft tissue if it's bleeding, that also is helping. So correct the aculopathy, stop the bleeding as much as you can, correct the hypothermia, correct the acidosis, you have a better chance. And that will take me to something called DC. DC. Anybody stand, know what it stands for? There's a concept in trauma that appeared about 15 years ago. It's called damage control. Damage control. The reason I bring that is up to about the beginning of the 90s, all those difficult trauma patients, the bad, bad level ones, they were going to the OR and having major operations 
long, prolonged operation, and the surgeons and the intensivists were trying to correct everything in one go. They wanted to correct everything. There's a perforation in the colon, they want to deal with it or excise the colon, put things back together, look very pretty and everything. And then they found that all those patients, a good 90% of them, are dying. So that created a new concept in trauma called damage control. So what we do now, we deal with the three enemies that you mentioned. We do the acidosis, the hypothermia, and the curvity. We go to the operating room, we do the minimum. I do the minimum. If the spleen is bleeding, I get the spleen, and I get the hell out of there quickly because I need to go to the intensive care unit and do more resuscitation on this patient. I will leave the abdomen open. I will put what we call a wound vac. This is also one of the advances in trauma. Wound vac, which is a device that will suck all the fluid out from, from the peritoneal cavity and have the abdomen still open. I can go back a day two days later after I have corrected everything, and then I can decide whether the patient needs another new wound back, keep the patient many times, or, or close the patient. Many times we have a perforation in different parts of the small bowel. And I, for example, would divide here and divide here and remove the segment that has multiple holes in it. But I will not spend some time putting things together. I'll leave the staplers there. I put the nasogastric tube, I'll put the patient on fluids, if need TPN, go to parental nutrition, I will come 48 hours later and then deal with those segments and hook them back together. And this is the damage control. And the results were amazing. We started salvaging 90% of those patients where before we were losing 90% of those patients. Do I have time to talk about burns? Amy? Hmm? Okay, uh, let's make it quick. I'll, uh, we are not a burn center, I have to put that in advance. We deal with uh, Salt Lake City, we have a group of people there we have good association with. Uh, one of the senior people was here at St. Al's maybe a year ago and gave a very nice lecture. One of the advances in technology, and I don't need to tell you that, is the tele-technology where our ER doctors can contact Salt Lake and they can show them live the picture of that patient, the, uh, the Salt Lake uh, surgeon sitting in his home maybe, or her home, and watching on her, on, on her monitor, live picture of a patient sitting in the emergency department at St. Al's with the burn. And they can assess the burn, and they can guide us whether this is something that needs to go to the burn center or not. That's one of the big advances. Now, the patient comes with burn. All I can tell you about a burn patient is that the first step that you can do and help the patient is what? Before the airway, get the patient out of the burn. <laughs> that's that's number, priority number one. That's priority number one. And then you can start assessing what you need. The same principle applies ABC for trauma. Uh, uh, if the patient feels has an inhalation injury, and you can easily see that by burning of the eyebrows, the nose, uh, open the mouth, look if there's any carbonaceous sputum. The uh, inflammation in the pharynx, you can assume that the inflammation in the pharynx is the same inflammation in the trachea and the bronchial tree. Those guys definitely going to need intubation. The other thing is they need IV access. Why? Fluid and pain medication. This is a very severe, painful condition. They are so anxious and in pain and pouring epinephrine in their system that if you have an access, put an access. If you don't have an access, go through a burn area and put an IV line and give them a large dose of dilated or morphine and a lot of fluid. And the best guide to how much fluid they, you give, in the past there was formulas and park formula, they will tell you, we calculate this, this amount, half of it should be given in the first eight hours, the other half. The best indication how much fluid to give is? You're not good. Poor's man CVP. If you don't have a CVP, go buy the pure and out. Okay, make sure they are paying 100 cc per hour. You, you know that you're giving them a reasonable amount of fluid. Bring the patient to the trauma center. If there is any burn, if there is any chemical thing, wipe it. And then irrigate the area if we're concerned about it with some warm saline. Make sure that those patients don't get hypothermic. That's another very important patient. The burns, just cover them with some sterile dressing. Very important. And give them to the burn center. And then, 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 then you can do further assessment. 
the surface area of the burn. There's a rule of nine. You can read all about that in, the, in, in any trauma journal. It's a bit different from the rule of nine is different in pediatrics, simply because the head in the pediatric patient has more surface area. So in, in, in me, for example, it's 4.5% here and 4.5% here. In an infant, it's 9% here and 9% because the head surface area is larger in the, in the pediatric patient compared to the rest of the body. Types of the burns, there's a first degree, a partial thickness and full thickness, there's some differentiation. The first degree is usually patients that we can deal with in a non-burning center. You see a bit of hyperemia, it's painful. Most of the treatment at the time we used to give them silvetine. Now we give them bacitracin. But we cover them, we see them on a regular basis. A lot of them will not even need a skin graft. The second degree, the, the partial thickness, are the ones that usually are characterized by blisters. You see blisters, they are painful, hyperemic. These are the patients that will need attention, usually an admission and deal with them. And the third one is, is the leathery skin. And the characteristic thing about the full thickness is no pain. No pain. These are also in need to go to the trauma center where the burn has to be excised and covered and skin grafts have to take place. Carbon monoxide, if anybody doesn't have a carbon monoxide monitor at home, please get one. Because the first 20% uh, you're looking good, and then for some reason or the other, once it gets 20% and more, you are comatose and you don't know why. It's very important. The problem with carbon monoxide is it displaces oxygen from hemoglobin. The affinity, the affinity towards hemoglobin is 240 times, 40 times that oxygen. So if you have somebody and you made a diagnosis of carbon monoxide, what should you do? Give them oxygen, but not only oxygen, you give them 100% oxygen. That's the only way you can displace the carbon monoxide from the hemoglobin. With 100% oxygen, you can displace the thing in 40 minutes. With just normal oxygen, about four hours. This is frostbite. Uh, that's a whole topic all the way, but the pathophysiology of frostbite is crystals precipitating in the capillaries of the digits. And eventually there's hypoxia and gangrene, and eventually hypotension. And the treatment is aggressive resuscitation, aggressive rewarming. Not a dry heat, but moist heat, whirlpool, with a, run, with a current running at 40 degrees and even more. For the chemical, all you have to do is wash the chemicals. Don't, if it's an acid or base, don't counteract it. Don't give base to an acidic product or vice versa. Just wipe the thing, because that will create a reaction and the thermal heat will come out. Uh, the alkali, alkali is worse than the acid because they penetrate the skin more. For electrical burns, they are very misleading because on the outside you don't see anything, but on the inside the current has gone and the body attacked at the vacuum, and there could be a lot of cardiac irritability. Make sure you do an EKG and monitor the patient and make sure you, you um, measure creatinine kinase because those guys can develop uh, rhabdomyolysis and bone to renal failure. And the treatment is a lot of fluid and sometimes bicarbonate in addition to that. And drowning, get the patient out of the water, turn the face to the side, do aspiration, prevent any vomiting, and if they are in cardiac arrest, you have to do CPR and oxygenate them, intubate them accordingly. So one last note I just want to mention about uh, the, the advances in trauma. Uh, <clears throat> number one, the wound vac that I told you about. You don't have to close the wound and look, it's very pretty. We can repeat the wound vac again and again until we are ready to close the abdomen. Number two <clears throat> is that the rib plating that I mentioned is helping certain people. Number three is stents, usually by the vascular surgeon for aortic injuries and other vascular injuries. Very, very little invas invasive procedures compared to damage control that I explained to you, including the three enemies that I deal with, and the interventional radiology, where they are doing miracles now for bleedings that we cannot reach. And I mentioned about the spleen, but the same thing applies to the pelvis. There are many patients who will come with disability in the pelvis, open pelvis, uh, shearing injury, one side is higher than the other, lateral impact, uh, the front impact is the open pelvis. Those guys are bleeding from pelvic vessels that we cannot reach as surgeons. In the old days, we would open and pack that area. That's all we can do and try to give blood. 
Now we give blood and blood products. We collect, it, collect the aculopathy, and those guys from the IC, from the uh, CT suite, they go to intensive radiology. They have miracles where they coil those bleeding and stop the bleeding. The most difficult cases that I have encountered is when a patient comes and I know he's in shock or she's in shock and bleeding, but I don't know where. That can be very difficult. In the past, we used to do something called diagnostic peritoneal lavage, DPL. We don't do it anymore. It's not very sensitive. And it gives me no idea about bleeding in the retroperitoneum. The CT scan is much better. Now the fast is helping. But there were cases when you're not sure if the patient bleeding from the pelvis or bleeding from a spleen. And this is, it has to make an intelligent call here, where to go. And so far I have been very lucky. I go to intensive radiology, they sort out the bleeding from the pelvis, and then I monitor the patient that is still bleeding, I go to the operating room and remove the spleen if necessary. But these are the most difficult cases. So trauma has changed, the results are much better. Even trauma in the elderly has changed. Last year, 2012, I think, in the uh, trauma meeting in Sun Valley, I gave a talk about with one of the neurosurgeons about trauma in the elderly. And in summary, there's not much difference between trauma in the elderly and trauma in, in, in young people. You just have to be more aggressive with the elderly people because the reserves are less, and you have to be aggressive in the first two to three days, and after that, even if, if you feel that Despite your best, uh, despite your best resuscitation is still not working, you have to talk to the family and see what are the endpoints here, what are their wishes, and involve palliative care. Any questions? Question. Go ahead. For the elderly, you talk about being more aggressive with therapy. Does that count for the field also? For what? In the field. Being yes. More aggressive. Yes. Because you don't know much there. You have to do it. You have no choice. Even if the outcome to you, I mean, I resuscitate a lot of people that I'm not very confident they are going to make it. But initially, I have no choice. I have to do it and I have to do the best for them. But you're saying to be more aggressive, just yes. pushing fluid and everything. Yes, absolutely. You. you will do that. Thank you. Hmm? <clears throat> Minor traumas in the elderly have the, have, the, have the possibility of causing potential serious injuries, even minor traumas. Those guys, everything is down. The only thing is up is stroke. The cardiac output is down, the cardiac index is down, the urine output is down, muscle mass is down, reflexes, eye, vision, hearing, everything is down. The ability to get out of the difficult situation, whether it was a fire or an accident, to escape is down. Their coordination is down. Their arthritis. So those guys, you have to be very aggressive with them. Their reserves are down. They cannot tolerate. They uh, same injury in a young person. The, the young person might walk away. The older the person, they need intubation and intensive care unit. And, but again, the, all the literature is showing now we have to be aggressive. But we cannot be aggressive for a long time because now the technology can allow us to put patients prolong their life for months but there has to be some common sense somewhere where to terminate and the, the best way is to talk to members of the family to see if there's any wishes that the patient has had before discuss what are what, what are the goals here 
so that if we decide that even with aggressive treatment we are not winning, we have to terminate and we usually involve palliative care in our institution. Any other questions? Thank you, folks. It has been a pleasure. Thank you.